Hello, everyone. My name is Sai Venom, and I'm your host today for Containers from the Couch. Today, I'm joined by Micah Hausler, who is the principal software engineer at AWS, focusing on a lot of things, but mainly on Kubernetes. Today, he's going to be talking about Cedar, an all new open source language for access control. So, Micah, my first question to you tell us a little bit about Cedar. Yeah, so Cedar is an authorization. Uh, policy language, but it's also an open source evaluation engine by AWS. So it is a way that you, you as a user and any user can enforce policies at some authorization point, whether that's a permit or forbid and all kinds of uh, variations on that. Excellent. Now, authorization, authentication, two very different things. Authentication, of course, figuring out who you are. But authorization is figuring out who can perform what actions on which resources. So Cedar primarily focuses on authorization, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Authentication being identity and authorization being what you can do. Um, what we've done over the last couple of months is integrate Cedar with Kubernetes. So you can basically decide, does this request get permitted or not using Cedar with Kubernetes? A lot of folks might be wondering, why should we use Cedar for Kubernetes specifically? Yeah, that's a great question. So Kubernetes already has a authorization language. Most people are pretty who are using Kubernetes or have used Kubernetes are pretty familiar with Kubernetes RBAC or role-based access control. It's a in Kubernetes API to define who can do what. Um, and it's been in Kubernetes. I looked this up the other day since one dot uh, 1.3, I think, is when it entered uh, Kubernetes as beta. And it, so on at that point, it was on by default. So it's it's been a while that that's been in Kubernetes. But RBAC is, is the existing policy language of Kubernetes. But it has some limitations. It's uh, allow only. So you can say, this user can do this thing. And it's uh, pretty basic in terms of um, what, what resources can be authorized. So I could say, Sai, I'm going to let you create uh, a deployment, but I can't govern what the name of that deployment is. So you can create any deployment if you can create a deployment. And uh, I can also say you can create a deployment in a specific namespace, but I can't say accept a specific namespace like the cube system namespace. So from that point of view, it is, um, it's stable and has been around a long time and well known, but it just has some limitations that we found our, we ourselves at AWS and our customers are just encountering these limitations daily. You know, that makes a lot of sense. And I've, I've been in this place before where we're trying to create some complicated, you know, policy management as well as authorization policies uh, where let's say you want to let a user apply or create certain Kubernetes resources, but maybe not if there's like a certain label pair on them. So this resulted in a scenario where you would have to basically create maybe an RBAC policy, as well as an authorization policy using a different language, maybe OPA or, or, or Caverna or something like that. Um, and so there was a bit of complexity associated with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you're, you're dead on about, uh, about OPA Gatekeeper or Caverno or even validating a mission policy in Kubernetes 130, um, where you can write uh, the common expression language or cell in, in validating admission policies that you don't have to actually make a webhook call. It gets evaluated in the API server, but it can do the, some of those same restrictions. But you're exactly right. It's a different language than RBAC. It's a different um, different framework, a different policy file. And when if you're tasked with defending a Kubernetes cluster, you have to think about, OK, I'm going to do an allow over here in RBAC, but I'm going to have to write a denial in a different policy language, in a different framework, in a different file. And that just becomes a lot of cognitive overhead, not just for the person writing it, but Sai, if you wrote that policy and posted a PR on GitHub and I have to go review that policy, like who's going to remember down the line when you make a one line change in the denial rule? Oh, is that, is that okay? Like, I, I don't remember what the RBAC policy is. I have to go look it up and keep track in my head of all of this. And so that, that becomes just a really, uh, really key point of, of, of tension for, for securing a cluster. Yeah, and, and I think one of the cool things here is that we're not necessarily replacing anything. They, they still, uh, Cedar will still work with 
uh, RBAC or other policy engines you might be using, but uh, we're, we're aiming to, to streamline some of these things, right? And, and potentially exactly. for, for certain policies, let them all be managed in just Cedar, which is pretty compelling, but let, let's see how it looks. Yeah, yeah, so we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, so we, we've posted, we've put on GitHub, the Cedar access control for Kubernetes. You can go check it out. It's uh, on GitHub under AWS Labs, um, Cedar access control for Kates. Um, but uh, so it's all open source. You can you can try this out locally. Um, but I want to give a brief intro just into Cedar and what that looks like before we jump into what that means for Kubernetes, because there's a little bit of a learning curve, but it's very, very readable and very easy to learn. Um, it's not a programming language. It's an access policy language. So you don't have to learn. Uh, it's not like learning a new programming language. It's it's more of just saying, okay, I want to allow and permit things. Um, so Cedar, Cedar, as I mentioned, is is an open source policy language by AWS, and it's very flexible. You can use it for all kinds of things, not just Kubernetes. We've just taken it and applied it to Kubernetes here. So it's a very basic P Cedar policy. I've demonstrated here on my screen. Um, you have an effect, so either a permit or a forbid. And then you have three sections of your policy. You have a principle, so what actor is, is uh, the rule applying to? An action, so what action does the rule apply to? And then a resource, what resource does the rule apply to? So uh, with Cedar, you can define if, as, a, as an implementer of Cedar, your own principle, action, and resource types. So in this contrived example here, I've got a principle called my principle type by some identifier, an action by some action name, and a resource by some resource type and some identifier for it. And I'm going to permit it with this rule and forbid um, a different action, some other action name, in this forbid rule. Um, so that that's the simplicity of Cedar is just it's these three, three uh, principal action and resources that apply to your policy. And then it also supports conditions. So um, you could write something like when, so uh, some some condition that applies when true, and an unless clause optional to to make the effect not apply when that condition is met. So I have a policy here that forbids principal is a Kubernetes user on action, Kate's admission action create, so an, a create action on admission, when the resource is a config map, when that config map name is test user. And the reason why this is this specific example is, is sort of dem a good demonstration is authorization policies can't for, uh, forbid or restrict a creation of a resource and know its name. The Kubernetes authorization requests only evaluate basically what's in the URL. And so when you create a resource, whether it's a pod or a config map in the Kubernetes API, that's not actually in the URL of the create call. So authorization doesn't get that parameter, but admission does. And so in this case, we can restrict some, some type of Kubernetes uh, request for making a config map when the, the resource name is test user. And, and Micah, I've, I've just got to ask real quickly, there's no agent or anything needed to, to evaluate this, or, or how, how, does, how does this language get uh, translated into the necessary you know, Kubernetes yeah. artifacts and, and, and resources for this to work? Yep, so Kubernetes has a couple different extension points for access control. One is, uh, and these are built into Kubernetes already today. So one is uh, an authorizing webhook. That's configured by a cluster administrator. For a cloud managed cluster like EKS cluster, users don't have control over that. It's a Kube API server flag. Um, but uh, the other is admission webhooks. And that's something that users and users do have control over. They can make their own admission webhooks and configure those themselves. So what this, this uh, framework does is plugs into both those extension points into Kubernetes and converts the Kubernetes request for an authorization, that's the subject access review. That's the API shape, which contains principal and resource info and action info. And we massage that into a, a Cedar request and using the Cedar framework say, hey, this is the input of the principal action and resource. Given this set of policies, this is allowed. And then same for admission. When we have an admission review that, that the Kubernetes API, API server sends to the admission webhook, uh, 
we convert that into principal action and resource and can evaluate that against CEDAR policies. Got it, got it. So interoperable with existing Kubernetes approaches like RBAC, but uh, flexible because it, it allows you to kind of combine the admission webhook, admission validation, along with uh, authorization. That's that, really powerful to me. That's exactly right. Excellent. Um, now, let's follow up on this a little bit more. Uh, talk a little bit about attribute-based access control and, and how that's you know more powerful or, or allows for more use cases than maybe traditional approaches. Yeah, exactly. That That's one of the really uh, nice parts of Cedar where it really shines, especially when integrating in Kubernetes. Um, with Cedar, uh, what we saw in these example policies so far is pretty basic, right? We can have a principle that is a user or a resource that is a config map. But when we want to start getting into conditions and attributes, like you mentioned, we we want to we want to address those. And uh, so let me pull up uh, another file here. Um, every principle and action can have. Uh, attributes attached to it. So when you authenticate as a user, you have a username. Uh, you have some key value extra info that Kubernetes adds about who you are. When you have a resource, there are attributes of that resource. For, for Kubernetes authorization requests, think about an RBAC entry. You have, I can actually pull up an example here. So in an RBAC policy, you have rules. You have an API group. You have resources, verbs, you have, might have a namespace um, that's not going to be in this rule file, but you might have a resource name as well. Those are all attributes of the authorization request. So with Cedar, we can do things like an attribute of a user must match an attribute of the request. And that's really what you get into when you get into ac uh, attribute-based access control. Um, so here's a, just a quick illustration. Say I want to permit a user to uh, do a, off, uh, a list or a watch request against the Kubernetes API. So a list is a, just a list, and a watch is a, a streaming update from the Kubernetes API for some Kubernetes resource. But I'm going to limit that request. The request must be a secret type. The API group must be the empty API group, which is the core API group in Kubernetes. Um, the, re the request must have a label selector. So we, we put that as part of the resource. Um, so when you use kubectl, you can do kubectl get dash L for label selection, key equals value. And then we check, does the label selection here have the key owner? And is the value the principal's name? So we're on, we have this operation of, con, of label selection, label selector contains. And on the left-hand side, we have the resource. And on the right-hand side, we have the principal. So we can now compare, hey, this principal can only make requests where the owner is their name. That's something that you just can't do in RBAC. Or if you want to try to do uh, in some other framework, you have to expl explicitly code. Sai, you can get config maps where config map equals your name and literally type out your name. Um, and this lets us write a flexible policy that applies to any amount of users. Awesome. And and how do you apply these policies to a Kubernetes cluster? Let's say customers running on EKS, you just, you know, is it is it is it YAML or, or do you apply the Cedar directly? How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So when when using this against a cluster, when using Cedar with a cluster, can't run it with an EKS cluster today, but if you're running it against a kind cluster locally, um, one of the attributes that this or one of the features that this uh, authorizer and admission webhook support is a, a Cedar policy CRD. So we can uh, craft a uh, authorization policy as a YAML file. So we have a policy, to, the API version is Cedar, kind is policy, and we can write in, in the YAML some, some permit, so a permit or forbid um, policy. And just like you would an RBAC policy or any other kind of, of policy, kubectl will apply this. That will be created in the cluster, and this, the authorizer will look for all of those policies. Awesome. So, so no agent, just just some CRDs. Take advantage of the existing webhooks, existing Kubernetes APIs. That's that's really powerful. And and so, Micah, you know, looking forward, uh, what are you most excited about for Cedar? You mentioned you know EKS support is not there yet, but mm -hmm. what, what's what's exciting when you look on the roadmap? 
Yeah, there's a couple of really exciting features that I think we want we want to build for this. Um, one of them is uh, not only the fact that um, you can apply a policy via a custom resource in a cluster, but one of the other challenges when writing any kind of policy, whether that's an RBAC policy, a validating emission policy um, with Kubernetes 130 plus, or or other you know admission framework like a Gatekeeper or a or a Caverno is that you have to individually apply that to every cluster. With Cedar, we can have multiple what we call policy stores. So rather than just getting policies from the CRT, imagine if there was an AWS API for this, where you could centrally apply a policy, not just one cluster, but tens, hundreds of clusters, even maybe spanning accounts um, or regions. Then you could you could have a single place to apply some some global policy. Now that's the, you know that's a very sharp knife. Like that's something that you wouldn't want to uh, necessarily do uh, without testing. But that's something that we could we could build. Um, to that point too, one of the other exciting features of Cedar is that every policy decision that gets made, um, the Cedar engine gives you a reason. It says this policy either permitted it or denied this request. And because of that feature, we can do things like. Uh, build uh, observability to say, hey, this rule, this was denied because of this reason. And not only that, we could we could do something like uh, make a at a tracking or audit mode before we have an enforcement mode for a policy. So this isn't built yet, but this is more just a, a future possibility of what we could do to say, hey, I want to try this policy out against all my production clusters, but I'm afraid it might break things. And I would like to test that out and do get some metrics on that maybe for a week or a couple of weeks um, to either find if there are any uh, violations or if there are, how do I clean those up? And then I can feel have confidence in turning on that that new enforcement. Excellent. The, the future is definitely exciting here. Now, we know that Cedar is being developed uh, open source in the community. Uh, Micah, what's a good way for our viewers today to get involved, to share feedback, to see what's coming up on the roadmap, or really anything else with the project? Yeah, the best thing you can do is try it out, honestly. So we, we have the repository on GitHub. You can go to github.com, um, AWS Labs, um, and find the, find the repository there. And uh, try it out, because we really, we really do want your feedback. Put, we can post a GitHub issue. Um, we're going to have a a monthly development call just for this if you're interested in getting involved and contributing to this. Um, but we really, really want feedback because uh, part one of the reasons we open sourced this was we we didn't think that um, just working on this alone in isolation and then presenting it as a feature, we might get everything right at first. We'd rather get your input first before we build this as a product into um, EKS. Awesome. Micah, it's been a pleasure having you on today. For our folks viewing at home, all of the uh, the resources shown and, and the links that Micah has mentioned will be in the description below. Follow along. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Micah, thank you again for joining us, uh, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks.